Good morning, Grace Community Chapel. So good to see you guys here this morning. All those watching online, welcome, and we are glad that you are here this morning. I wanted to start out by reading some scripture that came, uh, came up in one of my devotions this week. It's from Psalms chapter 40. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He said he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And he ends this chapter by saying this, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. We invite you, church, all those who have experienced the love of God, all those who have experienced God's provision, God's help, God's deliverance, to stand this morning. Stand before your God and declare, Great is He this morning. Amen, church? Amen, church? Let's worship Him this morning. Is our God, and all will see. 
worship him. Yes, he is great. Amen. Try 
presence this morning and just worship you. We are thankful for these promises, these promises that whatever we are going through this morning, that whatever life season we are in, Lord, that you're with us. Lord, that you're working things out for our good. You're working things out to bring glory and honor to you. May those who are in that waiting right now, Lord, truly feel your presence right now in this moment. Truly feel your hand on their life and peace to walk through the rest of that journey. God, thank you for loving your people in such a great and awesome way. Lord, as we continue to worship you this morning, we ask you to just be at work through your spirit. Speak to our hearts. Speak to us through the message this morning. Let us hear what you have for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
worship him one more time there. Thanks for worshiping with us. You can be seated. Good morning, church family, and welcome. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we're glad you're here. If you're new to Grace, we hope that you'll allow us to get to know you by filling out a connection card. This is simply a way to let us know you are here, submit a prayer request, or ask for more information about Grace. You can find our digital connection card at gcchapel.org slash connect or you can find a paper copy tucked inside your bulletin. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to learn even more about our church or would like to become a member, we invite you to check out our next steps process. There are three elements, lunch at Grace, discovering Grace, and sharing Grace. We'll be hosting our next lunch at Grace next Sunday, February 7th. This is a time when we bring the lunch and you bring yourself. Pastor Jason and the ministry staff will rotate through the tables so that you have a chance to get to know us and we have a chance to get to know you. There is no cost, but you will need to register ahead of time. Head to our website and click on next steps at the top to learn more about all of the upcoming class dates and to register for lunch next week. Dates for upcoming next steps classes can also be found in your bulletin. We've got a couple of great things for men coming up quickly in February. The Men of Grace Bible Study begins tomorrow evening. This group meets weekly on Mondays from 6 to 7.30 in Upper Youth. Chris Lentz will spend some time at the first meeting casting the vision for men's ministry. And then you'll start a four-week study on Romans chapter 8 the following week. The format will be a video series followed by discussion and there will be snacks. There's no fee to attend, but it would be helpful if you register to ensure that we have enough space. Also for the guys, the Men of Grace Breakfast is back on starting Saturday, February 13th in Hope Hall. Men, join us for a hearty breakfast the second Saturday of each month. Come to enjoy good food and fellowship and bring a friend. There's no fee to attend, but an offering will be taken. Please register by February 11th to ensure that we have enough space and enough food. Masks are, not encur are encouraged, but not required. You can find all the details and sign up for both of these Men of Grace opportunities at gcchapel.org slash events. And finally, the announcement you've all been waiting for. Next week at Grace, the coffee returns. We'll have coffee and hot drink stations ready for you in Lower Youth and the Lower Hallway by Adult Central. Coffee stations will be spaced at safe distances, but for some of us, social distancing before our morning coffee is a preferred way of life anyway. We look forward to seeing all of you a little extra bright-eyed and bushy-tailed next Sunday. All right, everybody, that's all I've got. Have a great week, and we'll catch you later. All I'm saying, when coffee gets a round of applause, <laughs> it's coming. All right, no, so I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, we are in Luke again. If you've been with us, we've been talking through these meals, eating with Jesus. We are in Luke 19, for those who want to turn there, but we got a little run-up to get there first. So just a reminder or to put you into the context of what's going on, we're actually at the point in Luke where we're probably 10 to 14 days from Christ's death. We're about to enter into Holy Week. Jesus is actually on his path to Jerusalem where he'll have his triumphant entry and, and all the events that follow. So this is Three years of ministry behind Jesus. And, and in those three years, he's kind of built a reputation. You know, we've, we've seen this throughout as he's interacted with people and, and, and tax collectors and sinners. And he's given people the time of day. And he's even been bold enough to talk about how self-righteousness doesn't get you to heaven. And that the, the humble, you know, individual who's willing to repent is, the, is that bridge that thing that God has in his heart and we talked about last week about the parable of the two sons and that older brother who goes wait a minute but do you know what I've done like do you know the list of why I should be loved and in that whole situation and, and I even admitted last week that I'm much more the older brother than the prodigal of do you know how many times I've done the right thing and Jesus is there going do we do you want to go over the missus no, I just want to talk about the right things, you know, like where I've gotten it right. And, and even in Luke 18, and 
a parable he just told, nothing to do with food, but he even was bold enough to talk about two people praying in the synagogue and the Pharisee and the tax collector. And he actually said that the tax collector's humble prayer justified him, made him leave as correct in God's sight. And talk about a, talk about a, a contradiction there. Wait a minute. What do you mean the tax collector was justified in the Pharisee was not. All of this to say that Jesus has continued to push these limits and expand who he is and who he relates to and, and really has built both followers and enemies. And, and again, we're outside the picture, so we know his enemies are growing and we know what his enemies do in these next few weeks. But he's continued to be this this point of intrigue in a culture that has said, wait a minute, why, why should we give a tax collector the time of day? So this week we're in 1 through 10, and, and we probably have a familiarity with Zacchaeus' story, and we're going to dig into it, but it's one of those that we're going to try and get past all of our maybe Sunday school songs about it to go, what else is going on in this story? As you turn there, if you have your notes or you've used your notes, you're, you're going to notice I put in a, and I don't know, you English teachers can tell me, I called it a, a, a plot line. This is the thing that you've probably used since you were in elementary school, plot line, flow chart. I think I looked it up and it's called, the, I'd call it Freytag, but he was German, Freytag Triangle. I think is the official name from the 1800s of, this is basically what English teachers have taught you your entire life, of how do you plot the story so that you see what's going on and what's the climax and what's the conclusion. This is very common, but the reason I'm doing my notes in this format is so often I hear people tell me that, well, I haven't been properly trained to read the Bible, and yet you have been trained in many ways how to dissect a story. You know, like English has taught you that from third grade up, and and when I was in high school, it was, this was assumed that I could dissect a story. Zacchaeus actually lends itself to this diagram so easily that I was like, well, let's just use a preconceived or a a pre-learned concept to show you can dig through the Bible and figure out what the main point is using even things that public school system has taught you. So that's just a reference point. There's There's no special thing in this. I just thought it might be something that's another technique for us to pull God's Word apart and to understand what's the focus, what's the big idea, and what should I be learning from it. So we'll use that diagram, but again, we're in Luke 19, reading 1 through 10. So starting in 1, and again, I've been changing as we start stories, all of the he's to Jesus, because it's talking about Jesus. So reading, starting in verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. And so he ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. When Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So, we're going to look at Zacchaeus' story. We're going to see what's going on in this. And, and if you've, in notes, a lot of times I, I ask a question and maybe you read it beforehand to try and get you thinking. And today's question was, what's the last thing you Googled? And, and There's a reason why I ask this and the idea of what our perspective is, but do you understand any more for us, and and if you don't like Google, whatever your preferred search engine is, if you're a DuckDuckGo or Yahoo or whatever, like if I have something I don't know, I go and get it immediately. 
Like, you know, like, that's one of the great things of the day and age I'm in. I don't have to sit and go to, like, a library and use that old card catalog I was trained to use as a second grader and things like that. But I get to just go, all right, like, I can find this answer. And so when I sat down this morning, I was like, all right, if I asked them what was the last thing, what was the last thing I Googled? And it was actually a pretty funny one, so I'm going to tell you. Last thing I Googled yesterday was a chandelier. Anybody have any idea what a chandelier is? Someone in first, you know it too. Yeah, someone does. Someone in first service knew it too. I was like, I had no clue. It's, it's a rooster. You know, like, it's actually, they would describe it as a fierce rooster. But how did I come across this? I was actually watching a college basketball game yesterday, and Coastal Carolina's mascot is the Chandeliers. And so they're referring to them as Chandelier, and I was like, how in the world, first off, what is that, and why as a university would you pick that as your mascot? And so I Googled, what is a Chandelier? And guess what Coastal Carolina has? A whole section of their website called, what is a Chandelier? Because they probably have had that asked multiple times. And it's really this they, they described it as a fierce, determined rooster. And, and from their perspective, they got it from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So they, there's a story within his Canterbury Tales in which the rooster showed great determinations, or really the Chanticleer, showed great determinations and fierce, a fierceness that they went, we're going to name the mascot of our university after this. So that's the last thing I Googled if I did not have a a device that would tell me that, I would still be going around going, oh, well, I have no, no clue what that is, but I'm not going to go figure that out. But because it was easy access, I did it. So why is that the question? Why is that the framework I'm trying to get? Because we have to understand that Zacchaeus is in this same situation. Zacchaeus is not a Google person. He's not a guy who just goes, I'm going to figure this out. He's a guy who has heard the rumors. So our introduction into this story is Zacchaeus is a rich, corrupt tax collector. That's our introduction there in, verses two, in verse 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Now, some of you might say, well, it doesn't say corrupt. You're right, but that's the implication anytime they talked about tax collectors and it's confirmed in verse 8 when he says all right all of the people I've defrauded I'll pay back four times so yes he fulfilled the the stereotype and the implication in there so it's, it's not me adding something but Zacchaeus is this this rich tax collector and this rich tax collector and I actually did a sermon a little while ago where we talked about the Roman system and how this guy was probably as rich as rich comes. Where he's, as the, one of the more, the, the more blessed cities, one of the richer cities in the area, you know, is he is the, the head guy there is probably one of the richest people around. Like elite status. But he's also probably has a bunch of people working under him. And so He's heard these rumors. He's heard this idea that there's this guy, Jesus, and he's actually sharing dinner with, with tax collectors. And, and he actually is telling individuals that there's a, there's a worth in them and that they're important and that they're loved by God and that they're cared about. And so Zacchaeus has this curiosity and so how this story goes is Jesus comes to town. That's simplified in verse 1 as he passes through Jericho. So Jesus comes to town. He's traveling. He's working his way through. And Zacchaeus is led to go, I'm curious about this guy. Like, is he who he, people are claiming? And, and unlike when Jesus comes to town, like, I could just go and Google whatever I want to say, Who's Jesus? Why is he a big deal? Like, what should I know about him? One of the bottom lines. Zacchaeus is going to have to seek this himself. And so Jesus has come to town, and Zacchaeus' curiosity has caused him to seek Jesus. It's caused him to go, I, I need to figure out who this Jesus is. In our story, that's summed up there in the rising action of four. So he ran, actually three and four. So Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not be because he was small in stature. 
And so we ran ahead and climbed up on a sycamore tree to see him, and for he was about to pass that way. So Zacchaeus, curious about the reputation of Jesus, has decided to seek Jesus, his version of Googling Jesus, all right? Not the, not the perfect analogy, but that's the only way Zacchaeus is going to know, is this guy for real? And so he seeks him. And again, this is one of those pictures that you look and go, all right, I can understand the analogy of rich, rich, all right? I can understand the analogy of even corrupt rich. I don't really understand the analogy of corrupt rich climbing a tree to see something. Like, if I ever walk down the street and Bill Gates is up a tree going, nope, just wanted a better view, like, Bill Gates needs a mental hospital. You know, like, it just, it doesn't line up. It doesn't line up with who he is and, and what he possesses and the type of people he has at his disposal. And yet for Zacchaeus, Christ needed investigated. And so here he is up a tree and Jesus is about to pass. And as Jesus passes, something very unique happens. In fact, it, it might be one of the only times in the Bible you see this in which we've done a whole series about Jesus eating with, with people, and we've seen Pharisees invite him over, and we've seen people invite him into the house, and a lot of invites, Jesus flips this, and, and Jesus invites himself to dinner. I think this is going to be one of the only times you see in the Bible, Jesus basically go, I'm inviting myself, and you see that there where Jesus comes up to the tree in verse 5, and and looks up and says, Zacchaeus, hurry down for, I'm coming to your house. I must stay at your house today. Could you imagine just that mindset? You can probably have a little of that. Like, when's the last time you were out in public and someone came up to you and called you by name and you looked at them and have no clue who they are? You know, like all the things that are running through your head of like, who is this? Why am I supposed to know them? What have I forgotten? What do they know about me? You know? This is Zacchaeus checking out a guy who calls, walks up to him and just stares at him and goes, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to dinner. Even just think of how your reaction would be. If you're walking through a supermarket today and someone walked up to you that you don't know and goes, Jason, I'm coming to dinner. I'm going, no, you're not. Like, I'm not inviting you. You don't get to invite yourself. You know, like, it's, it's such a unique interaction here, something I would call a weird interaction here. And yet again, as we have Jesus who gets more and more, extreme might not be the word, but how about we say bold, more and more bold in his interactions. And literally in Luke 18, just told the Pharisees in a parable, but that maybe the tax collectors are, are seen with more grace in God's sight than you. And that's bold. And now he walks up in a town that has plenty of people, plenty of Jews he could go to, and he picks the corrupt, rich man that probably nobody likes and goes, Zacchaeus, your house is where I'm going. This again, if, if you are a person who struggles with grace, with this idea that you are loved un, with with no reason, this unmerited love, like, this is another example of Jesus pouring it out in, in plenty. And, and, and I don't think it's one of those things that you would say, well, he's, maybe Zacchaeus was an all right guy. Like, no, like, put yourself back into tax collector, and he's a Jewish tax collector. I could probably make an argument how he's the least like Jew in Jericho. Chief tax collector. Tax collectors are already viewed by the Jews as traitors who have turned their back on their heritage, their, their country, their identity to collect money for the Romans. So like you're an outcast, you're unliked, and now you're like the head of them, the one who has made yourself filthy rich off the back of our taxes. Nobody likes you, Zacchaeus. And Jesus goes... Of all the people, you're it, Zacchaeus. I'm spending today with you. Again, like, that is mercy and grace at levels that are hard for me, the older brother, to comprehend. 
why would you love someone that much? And please don't think that I'm the only one who reacts like this. Do you see what the whole crowd reacts like? The whole crowd there in verse 6 and 7. So Zacchaeus 6 is Zacchaeus hurries down and receives him joyfully. And when they saw this, they, they all grumble. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. The crowd's reaction is, that's garbage. Like of all of us, and, and again, far, probably plenty of those internal thoughts going, do you know why I deserve Jesus at my house? Let me tell you. Do you know where the artwork came in that temple? I put that one up. And do you know how much money I've given in the last two years? Yep. And do you know, and it's like the list of this is why I deserve this. The crowd doesn't hold back on, like, why are you giving this to the person that we do not like? And yet again, as Jesus ends his earthly ministry here in the next two weeks, after three years of getting bolder and bolder, he offers mercy and grace to still the lowest of the low in people's sight. He offers a chance for relationship with the Son of God. This, this picture still is a great image of, I didn't approach Jesus and go, hey, Jesus, I need help. Jesus approached me and said, hey, Jason, I love you and I care for you and let me offer you hope. Like That's what, that's what grace is. It's not that I've earned it or deserve it or is, it's not that I've lived good enough of a life and I haven't messed up in any super big ways that God's like, he's salvageable. But Christ here at the end goes after the people that everyone in society goes, well, they can't be saved. Don't waste your time. Zacchaeus, garbage, traitor, horrible Jewish person. And Jesus, even in verse 9, says, is he not a son of Abraham? Does he not deserve this mercy and grace? The, the climax of the story, the, that point in which the story is built to is Zacchaeus' salvation. Zacchaeus comes to know the Lord. He receives it joyfully and, and even is changed by that. That's even the evidence where if Zacchaeus stayed as that Lying, cheating, hoarding, corrupt tax collector. Wouldn't we all go, does he really know Jesus? You know, like, did his heart really change? And yet Zacchaeus is so moved. He goes, you know what, Jesus? Half I have, I'll give to the poor. He's not buying his salvation. You could very easily twist that into, oh, Zacchaeus had to do that to buy his salvation. No, he's doing that because his heart has been changed to break for where Christ's heart breaks. I'm going to give to those who, who are in need. And, and anyone I've cheated, I will make restoration with. And not just like dime for dime, but I'll go four times what I owe them. That's the falling action, I truly think, is Zacchaeus actually going out and doing this. And, and the funny thing is, is I would love to know how many people accepted the money from Zacchaeus that he cheated and went, Man, Zacchaeus, maybe we should give him a second shot. And how many people went, still never going to interact with Zacchaeus, but I'm not turning this much money down, you know? Because I'm sure there was mix there. I, I'm willing to guess no one said, no, Zacchaeus, you keep the money, no problem. Like, all right, I'll take it. But Zacchaeus changes who he is. I, I truly believe, and again, Jesus has never condemned tax collectors. He was even asked one point when tax collector says, what should I do? He says, only collect what you're supposed to. Like, do your job with integrity and quit cheating people. So Jesus is an anti-tax collector. I truly believe that in Zacchaeus' change, he becomes a tax collector with integrity, a person who becomes a trusted individual. It doesn't mean everyone's going to like him. We know that Jesus does the right things and people kill him here in a couple weeks. But for us, it's, it's something that has changed us. And again, Christ's last statement in this, this story, this interaction, is to reiterate why he's here. 
He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus didn't come just to fluff people up and enjoy the self-righteous and accept the praise of everyone who wants to say, you're a great guy. He came because he knew there were people in trees trying to figure out who he was and he cared enough about them to, to chase them, to seek them and to offer them grace and mercy, to say it doesn't matter the junk you've done in your life, an eternity can be altered because of what is offered. That's still what he's out there doing, offering a change to an eternity. Maybe, maybe we'd see a change in, in earthly fortunes, but that's never guaranteed in the Bible to say, man, if you love Jesus, you'll be rich. Never guaranteed. But knowing Jesus changes your destination. For us, one of the questions that then comes out of this is, Zacchaeus needed time with Jesus to truly be changed. Like, this wasn't Zacchaeus just hearing the rumors about Jesus and going, all right, all my tax collector's friends say he's a nice guy. Like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just believe him. Like, Zacchaeus isn't Googling him from a distance and just coming up with an answer and going, all right, I can, I can answer the basics of who he is and, and what he stands for and what the bottom lines are. Zacchaeus needed to spend time with Jesus, to interact with Jesus, to to actually be in his presence, to, to build a relationship. So for, for us, the question becomes, how can we increase our time with Jesus? How do we increase that relationship and build that relationship? If I look at my life, I could probably classify the ways I've done it well and poorly. Like probably I could push most of my adolescence into, yes, I knew Jesus, but I found my my self-worth and my identity of sports. So like I found my acceptance through what I could do on an athletic field and, and God started to change that in college but I still would say college and my start of my career was yes I grew in my knowledge of Jesus but I found my security in a nice 30 year plan that offered not many many hiccups and not much risk, like the security of, well, I have a plan and it'll take care of me. And yet as God continued to work on me, yes, I might have grown some more to the point that he had me step into ministry, not because I was the guy qualified, not because I was the guy that God was like, man, you are just such a great guy, how could I not have you on my team? But it was much more of, listen, if I can take some uneducated fishermen and get them to do something, like, I can even work with you, Jason. Like, I'll figure a way to work you. And so you, you start to go, all right, maybe I'll take that next step. But, you know, we're always on that, that edge of going, well, haven't I learned enough? Haven't I, haven't I gained enough knowledge that can't I just hit the coast? Like, am I allowed to retire from Christianity to say, not that I, I don't believe in Christianity anymore, but can I stop growing? Can I stop praying, can I stop reading the Bible and just go, well, I've built up enough Christian equity that I don't need to do it anymore, and I'm just going to coast off my, my life savings. Like, that'll always be a temptation to put something into cruise control and go, I don't need to read the Bible. I, I, I did that for 20 years. I don't need to pray this week. Like, I, I've prayed plenty. And yet, this is another example of life change happens through interactions with Jesus, through time with Jesus, which means, yes, you still have to open your Bible, and you still have to dig into God's Word, and you still have to talk to Him, which is prayer. You still have to talk to God. You still have to build that relationship and make it a priority in your life, or you coast into, eh, it's somewhere. That's tough. Because some of us go, well, I don't, I, I've built up the equity. Isn't that my goal in, in most of life? Can I get to retirement with enough money to coast for the rest of my life? All right, probably a poor summary, but semi-goal. Can I correlate that to Christianity and go, when do I get to retire and not be 
someone who is offering grace and mercy to people in the trees. And yet our, our call as Christians, our, our call as the church is to continue to go out into the world and offer hope to hopeless, light into darkness, to let the people who are curious about, is this God who he says he is? Well, how do I help introduce you to the person who has changed my eternity? From Zacchaeus, it was true, the guy who had control to make the sick healthy, to make the lost found, to have the demon possessed, released from their bondage, to even make the dead alive. That's the God we serve. We shouldn't undercut him, and we shouldn't start to put him into some type of box to say, well, this is your time, and don't bother me and mine. And understand, Christ is the one who's seeking you because his goal is to seek and save the lost. It's a great hope to know that you're pursued by the 